The Gatekeepers of 9-11. Hello, I'm Alfred Schaefer. The purpose of this video is to help you understand what gatekeepers are and the role they play in suppressing the truth about what happened on that fateful September day in 2001. We must not underestimate the importance of this event just because the controlled mainstream media avoids this subject. Now, so many years after the false flag attack on the United States of America on 9-11, we find ourselves involved in multiple wars and our society fundamentally changed for the worse. We see no end in sight for the continuing downward spiral of death, destruction and loss of liberty. The gatekeepers of 9-11 are as guilty as those who conceived the idea of this catalyzing Pearl Harbor event. They are as guilty as those who placed the thermite in WTC 1, 2 and Building 7. They are as guilty as those who guided the military Boeing 767 drone aircraft that struck the Twin Towers. They are as guilty as Larry Silverstein for his role in this mass murder and multi-billion dollar insurance fraud. To begin with, let's watch an 8-minute Truth Seeker video that does an excellent job summarizing the nature of our problem. This 9-11, the world's top physicists, pilots, engineers joined victims' families to sidestep the mainstream media wall of silence. Huge billboards on Times Square and across the states confront the fact most Americans don't know a third giant tower on 9-11 wasn't even hit by a plane, yet somehow collapsed in free fall. At 5.20 p.m., World Trade 7 suddenly, neatly and symmetrically just folded like a pancake. This is high school physics. A building cannot do free fall with 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system without it being blown up. The government version is that office fires made all 84 steel columns break at the same time. But there are other versions. John Cole's among thousands of leading independent experts with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Great to speak to you. So who did it? Who didn't do it? is the, the 19 hijackers that allegedly flew the plane. It is impossible. It is impossible to melt that steel by the office fires, the jet fuel, or the collapse itself. It's a physical impossibility. It cannot be replicated experimentally. It defies the laws of physics. If you set aside your politics, you set aside your beliefs and your religion, and you use the scientific method. World Trade Center 7 is basically a classic controlled demolition that where a building free falls and comes straight down into virtually its own uh, footprint. Uh, the only explanation that explains all the evidence, the nanothermite, the, uh, the iron microspheres, the high temperatures found out there, the free fall, the uniform, what I call the uniform acceleration of the towers, when those came down, there was no impact or jolt when it hit the undamaged section below. Because there was no jolt, something blew those towers out, allowing it to, to uniformly uh, accelerate downward. The only thing that makes any sense at all from a scientific uh, perspective is that those towers were blown up. John made a mockery of mainstream sites, Nat Geo and Pop Mechanics, who've desperately tried, for instance, to show 175 pounds of military nanothermite couldn't break the columns. John did it with just one pound. Can thermite of any type burn through steel beams? I guess it can. Renowned librarian and researcher Elizabeth Woodworth has come in to help form the Consensus 9-11 panel, confirming it uses best practice with the most rigorous peer review. Thanks so much for joining us. There's this remarkably high consensus among experts that the government version can't be right. We have some of the top experts in the field who've published in uh, peer-reviewed scientific journals. And yet, these scientific journals exist, like the Herod study, but they're never covered in the media. If people knew about the research, uh, they would find it compelling. Dr. Griffin has said that he'd, he's never heard of anybody who saw the evidence, became converted to this point of view, and then changed back. Yeah, the panel's made government already change its story and admit Skyscraper 7's freefall. That's right. Uh, David Chandler uh, 
is an extraordinary uh, model maker. Chandler is on the panel, and he devised a model to prove that the top floors uh, fell with no resistance. There's only one way that that can happen, and that is that all the, the, the columns, there are 84 of these columns, that they were severed at the same moment. Dr. Graham McQueen accessed the New York Fire Department records from that day. Thanks very much for joining us. Never broadcast by mainstream media, but more than 100 witnesses have even reported the explosives bringing down the Twin Towers. Here was this roughly 10,000 pages of extremely rich eyewitness material. And I found that there were 118 people who clearly perceived explosions, you know. We have firefighters who are used to fighting high-rise fires, who are used to encountering, encountering smoke explosions and boilers, and yet they use words like bombs. You know, they don't identify with the things we would expect. Floor by floor, it's not a problem. It was as like, if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. If they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. Bob McIlvain has wanted answers why the post-mortem of his son Bobby found his fatal injuries in the South Tower consistent not with fireballs but explosives. Yet mainstream host Rachel Maddow here recently sneered he's not only a conspiracy theorist for asking questions but also attempted to connect him to violence and Al-Qaeda. All of these nefarious conspiracies about government plots to kill and conspire and lie about it and cover up the real truth. I mean, this stuff is as ridiculous as it has ever been, but it is as ridiculous as it is dangerous. Bobby's father joins us. Thank you very much for speaking with us. How do you feel first losing your son and now being portrayed as the bad guy? My son died. He, he was died from an explosion. I can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. If I was in a courtroom, I, a jury cannot not accept that as proof. So that's where we have our problem. And I say, well, this is an inside job. Well, my son died from an inside job from someone putting bombs, detonations. I would make her sit in this room and go through what I just went with you. And then I would say, now you tell me I'm a conspiracy theorist. Just shows you how awful our media is. I don't want to call her a the media. She makes over a million dollars, and they tell her what to say. One uh, newspaper reporter and is from the Philadelphia area was very upfront with me. She said, "You know, Bob," she says, "as a reporter, I am the problem because we will lose our jobs if I take that just that little bit you just said to the editor. He will crush it." So I'm, I'm telling you right now, I can't put your story out there. The media owners will not allow. Them. The press would not cover just that because it put a little doubt in people's minds. Yeah, who do you blame for all this? The people of the United States are just as much to blame because they just want to believe that we are good people. We are an exceptional country. But this is what governments do. You know, it's very Machiavellian. Now we have an endless war on terror. I know what these people in Iraq, I know what these people in Syria, I know what these people in Libya. Afghanistan and we're going through because they're all losing children and that's what it's all about everybody's losing family members and it's pure hell so that's it Daniel <laughs> tomorrow Congress votes to bomb Syria the latest war of the post 9-11 era the US would now officially be Al Qaeda's Air Force notes former Congressman Kucinich but America's had enough. Nine in 10 opposed this invasion, the most unpopular in history. Regarding 9-11, a massive 84% now say the government's lying. We now have the precedents documented that government's prepared to commit supreme crimes against its population. Exactly what happened on 9-11 can be argued by both so-called conspiracy theorists and the authorities. What's beyond dispute is on the 11th of September, the world will join to mourn the almost 3,000 innocent people who lost their lives. This is The Truth Seeker. Now, I would like to show you a short video of a gatekeeper in action, recorded as he spoke to the students at the University of Florida. It was seeing this video that so enraged me that I decided to write Professor Noam Chomsky an email to express my contempt for this deceitful behavior. Please pay attention to his evasive tactics in avoiding answering the question. 
Also, very disturbing, note the applause from his audience. All right. Noam, thanks for coming. Uh, you've mentioned quite a few contradictions from the media and, and their presentation on things. And I think the most uh, notorious case of this is with September 11th, 2001. You mentioned in a forum on Znet in 2006 that you wanted to see a consensus of engineers and specialists that understand the actual structures of these buildings and their possible collapse. Uh, and there is such a group, and I'm here to tell you about that and ask you a follow-up question. It's called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. There's a consensus of over 2,000 of them. All right, is this a question or Please a don't statement? interrupt. I'm asking a question. I'm setting it up. Thank you. This consensus shows that Building 7, the third building that fell on 9-11, fell in free fall speed, as the NIST report acknowledges. Are you ready to come forward and jump on board with 9-11? I know you've mentioned it's a distraction, but there's no better case of the media covering up things than pr not presenting Building 7, that third building. We've all seen the other towers fall, but what about Building 7, Noam? Well, in fact, uh, you're right that there's a consensus among a minuscule number of architects and engineers, tiny number, there are a couple of them are perfectly serious. They are not doing what scientists and engineers do when they think they've discovered something. What you do, when you think you've discovered something, what you do is write articles in scientific journals, uh, give talks at the professional societies, uh, go to the civil engineering department at MIT or Florida or wherever you are, and present your results, uh, and uh, then proceed to try to convince the National Academies, the Professional Society of Physicists and Civil Engineers, the departments in the major universities, convince them that you've discovered something. Now, there happen to be a lot of people around who spent an hour on the internet and think they know a lot of physics, but it doesn't work like that. And there's a reason why there are... I mean, there, there's a reason... There's a, may I finish? There's a reason why there are graduate schools in these departments and, and research. So the thing to do is pretty straightforward. Do what scientists and engineers do who think they've made a discovery. Now, when this is brought up, as it has been, uh, there are one or two minor articles, like this one article that appeared in an online journal which claims to have found where someone claims to have found traces of nanothermite in Building 7. Uh, I don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. Uh, but if it means anything, bring it to the attention of the scientific community. That's a couple of other fragments like that. So yes, there are, uh, there's a small group of people who believe this, and there's a straightforward way to proceed. Now, when this is brought up, there's a standard reaction. Scientists and engineers and professional societies and physicists are so intimidated by the government that they're afraid to take, to, they don't have the courage to take this position. Anyone who has any part, record of part, any familiarity with political activism knows that this is one of the safest things you can do. It's almost riskless. Uh, people take risks far beyond this constantly, including scientists and engineers. I can have run through and can run through many examples. I mean, you know, it's kind of a, maybe people will laugh at you, but that's about it. It's an almost riskless position. So that can't be the reason why nobody's convinced. However, there's a much more deeper issue, which has been brought up repeatedly, and I have yet to hear a response to it. There happens to be, whatever one thinks about Building 7, frankly, I have no opinion. I, I don't ha know as much uh, science and engineering as the people who believe that they have an answer to this. Uh, so I am willing to let the professional societies uh, determine it if they get the information. So whatever the facts, uh, there's just overwhelming evidence that the Bush administration wasn't involved. Very elementary evidence. 
You don't have to be a physicist to understand it. You just have to think for a minute, okay? So let's think for a minute. The, uh, there's a couple of facts which are uncontroversial, right? One fact that is uncontroversial is that the Bush administration desperately wanted to invade Iraq. That's a long-standing goal. There's good reasons for it. You know, second largest energy resources in the world, right in the middle of the world's major uh, energy producing region, you know, perfectly obvious reasons, which they in fact later stated, but they were obvious anyway. So they wanted to invade Iraq, one uncontroversial fact. Second uncontroversial fact, they didn't blame the 9-11 uh, on Iraqis, they blamed it on Saudis, mainly. That's their major ally. So they blamed it on people from their major ally, not on the country that they wanted to invade. The third uncontroversial fact, unless they're total lunatics, they would have blamed it on Iraqis if they were involved in any way. That would have given them a open season on invading Iraq, the total support, international support, the UN resolution, uh, no need to concoct uh, wild stories about uh, the weapons of mass destruction and uh, contacts between Saddam and Al-Qaeda, which of course quickly exploded, discrediting them. Uh, no reason to invade Afghanistan, and which was mostly a waste of time for them. But they didn't. Well, the, the conclusion is pretty straightforward. Either they are total lunatics or they weren't involved, and they're not total lunatics. So whatever you think about Building 7, there are other considerations to be concerned with. All right, I think our speaker um, answered that question succinctly, so that's the only question we'll have on that topic. Um, Noam Chomsky's evasive behavior, as well as his denigrating the vast community of not only architects and engineers, but scientists and other concerned citizens who are no longer silent about the obvious lies about what happened on 9-11, is what so enraged me. If he was an intellectually challenged person, this could be attributed to being plain stupid. But he has attained the status of a leading intellectual with a vast following of those who trusted him. This is why I wrote him, to articulate my disappointment. I will now read you my letter to Noam Chomsky, written on November 6, 2013. The title of this letter was Chomsky Stumbles. Dear Noam, since my days as a student, you were always an inspiration for me. You had the courage to speak out and write many excellent books in defense of the oppressed peoples of the world and in defense of democracy and justice. You had a secure place in the history books as being the fearless champion of so many of the civilized values we hold dear. Today, to my great dismay, I am having difficulty understanding why or what has motivated you to turn your back on humanity and reveal yourself as being nothing more than a cowardly traitor guilty of complicity in covering up the largest mass murder of innocent American citizens in modern history. You are lying to help conceal the truth about the Zionist false flag operation of 9-11. This is worse than pathetic. It is criminal unthinkable. Noam Chomsky places tribal instincts above his sense for humanity. Fortunately, your treachery is not going unnoticed. The disappointment of many of your former fans is clearly visible in the comments section beneath the following article and video. Chomsky covers up the JFK murder and 9-11, both of which Mossad was involved in and the power of the Jewish lobby in the United States in general. And did he ever mention the Jewish role in the Russian Revolution? Or the immense power of the Rothschild family with their fraudulent central banking? Or the destructive effects of cultural Marxism? No, he only criticizes corporations. Ultimately, it is always the same with these people. They cover for their own tribe. Some say Chomsky is a professional gatekeeper and works for the CIA. I say no. 
he works for his own tribe, like all of his co-tribals. Or, here's another typical comment. I began wondering about Chomsky one day when I heard him talking about JFK's murder. I just found it weird how pathologically uninterested he was in that seminal event and how he tried to play it down like it was no big deal. Now I will continue with my original letter to Noam. To help you understand the gravity of our predicament, I urge you to read this article, A German Viewpoint of 9-11 and the Zionist Threat. And please do take the time to go through the links at the bottom of the article. Noam, please pay particular attention to the RT video on the AE 9-11 link and remember your compassion when you see Bob McElvain mourning his lost son while being mocked by Zionist talk show host Rachel Maddow. Put yourself in Bob's shoes for just one moment. Do it, Noam Chomsky, and tell me what you feel. I am only asking one thing from you, Noam. I would like your opinion on the article, A German Viewpoint. Your denial of the evidence of 9-11 leads me to conclude that your fear of the evidence and the implication of this evidence is much greater than your courage to face up to the inescapable facts. You are suffering from the delusion that lying about the empirical evidence will eventually make the evidence disappear. You are assuming that the masses have been dumbed down, that's propagandized and brainwashed, enough to enable this lie to go through. This may be the case for far too many students who will applaud you after you lie to them, but if you could read minds, you would probably read the following on China's leader, Xi Jinping's mind, when he meets Obama the next time. You may read. Why don't the Americans just send a representative of the American people? What does this Zionist stooge who pushes the 9-11 lie want here? That's pathetic. It's embarrassing. It's criminal. If I wanted to talk to Netanyahu's little American slave, I would have said so. I was expecting an American president, not a pathetic slave. The rest of the world is not as deceived by the Zionist propaganda as much of the West seems to be. Noam, is it the fear of the consequences of the truth that prevents you from doing what is best for humanity and your tribe? People are realizing that homeland security is not a result of 9-11, but rather that 9-11 was the catalyzer needed to better sell the fascist police state we are now witnessing. The constant state of fear achieved by terror alerts is nothing but a marketing ploy to sell the unsuspecting general populace the fascist police state that we do not want. Instead of lying to college students, you should explain to them what the difference is between a Zionist and a Jew. To be anti-Zionist is no more anti-Semitic than it is to be anti-German because one doesn't like Nazis. Is it any better to proclaim that one is a Zionist than to proclaim one is a Nazi? To my friends at the BND, NSA, CIA, etc., please forward the links here into all your friends, colleagues, superiors, and children. Each and every one of us will eventually be judged by these two questions. Question number one. When did you become informed about what really happened on 9-11? Question number two. What did you do with this knowledge? Alfred Schaefer. What I just read you was the letter I sent to Noam Chomsky on November 6, 2013. I was pleasantly surprised to receive a reply from him the very next day. In his reply to me, there was neither a greeting nor a yours truly, only the following lines. Not sure what denial you are referring to. If you are referring to the fact that in answer to letters I have repeatedly outlined the very strong evidence that the Bush administration was not involved in 9-11, I'm afraid I can only say that I'll continue to do so until there is some response. So far it's only streams of insults like this. He did not answer a single one of my questions or statements, so I could not possibly leave it at that. On the same day, November 7th, 2013, I wrote him the following. Dear Noam, thank you very much for your response. You are questioning the involvement of the Bush administration in this crime against America. What about the fact 
that the Department of Justice investigation under Michael Chertoff allowed the steel to be destroyed without examining it to determine why these steel-framed structures collapsed. You say, not sure what denial you are referring to. I am referring to you denying the fact that the official government version is physically not possible. It could only be possible if you believe in magic. Noam, your complaint about streams of insults like this ought to be viewed as a symptom of the dam that is about to burst. Noam, and you are on the wrong side of this dam. To help you to understand how insulted the victims of 9-11 must feel, here is the link to the AE-9-11 Truth site with an 8-minute video aired on RT that should be helpful. The RT video is on the left side when you open the link. Next time you make a presentation, feel free to show this to your students. If you start doing that, Noam, you could still redeem your legacy. Once the dam bursts, it will be too late. Here's the link. Alfred Schaefer. Just overwhelming evidence that the Bush administration wasn't involved. Professor Chomsky responded on the very same day, but he did not really make a lot of sense. He continued to claim that the Bush administration was not involved, as well as putting off the architects and engineers as being irrelevant. He accused me of being arrogant. I'll read you his words. It requires extraordinary arrogance for you to think you have the right to speak for the victims of 9-11. You can, if you like, live with the illusion that you are part of a great mass movement rather than a small and isolated clique. Your problem, not mine. So again, I could not leave it at that. I will go through the most relevant parts of my reply to him written the next day, the 8th of November, 2013. Dear Noam, Thank you for taking so much of your precious time to correspond with me. You accuse me of being arrogant. I am sorry if I come across that way. I must learn to become more humble. Unfortunately, Noam, you have not answered the questions I asked, so I will ask them again. Please don't evade them as you did when that student in Florida asked you about WTC7 and you failed to answer his question. Not only did you evade his question, but you were applauded for your evasive response. Questions. Number one. What is your opinion on a German viewpoint of 9-11 and the Zionist threat? The piece I sent you. Question number two. What do you feel in your heart when Zionist talk show host Rachel Maddow mocks Bob McElvain for his mourning his murdered son Bobby? She mocks him as being not only crazy, but dangerous. I do not think this is a fair discussion if you evade my questions and simply respond with your own questions to me. I answered your question regarding proof of the Bush administration involvement in the crime of 9-11, but I must concede that I did not provide the details that you may be looking for, so let me try now. Noam, are you aware of the fact that there was no criminal investigation of the evidence from the World Trade Center, the crime scene where nearly 3,000 people were murdered on 9-11? How can that be acceptable? There was no, cr no criminal investigation because Assistant Attorney General Michael Chertoff, an Israeli-American dual national and son of a Mossad agent, allowed the crucial evidence to be destroyed. Any criminal investigation must start from the evidence. If the evidence is destroyed, there can be no proper criminal investigation. Rather than preserving the steel from the World Trade Center for a proper forensic investigation to determine how and why the structures had collapsed, Chertoff, who was the federal official responsible for prosecuting the crimes of 9-11, allowed the steel evidence to be scrapped without being examined. Nearly all of this crucial evidence wound up being hastily chopped up into small pieces in New Jersey scrapyards and shipped to China, where it was melted down. This is a clear case of a criminal destruction of evidence and Michael Chertoff is the person who allowed it to happen. Chertoff went on to be the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, where he maintained his control over the evidence of 9-11 because of the sensitive security information program being transferred 
to DHS, Department of Homeland Security. In this way, Michael Chertoff had effective control over the evidence of 9-11 for several years and allowed the most crucial evidence to be destroyed. Michael Chertoff, the son of an Israeli Mossad agent, i.e. Livia Eisen, allowed the steel to be destroyed because he did not want the evidence of explosives, thermite, melting, and nanothermite to be analyzed by steel experts. In the same way, he did not have the FBI examine the aircraft parts that were found so that the aircraft could be identified by its time-tracked numbered parts. If the official version of 9-11 is true, and 19 Arab fanatics did in fact cause all the destruction on 9-11, why has Michael Chertoff, an Israeli national, committed serious crimes to destroy the evidence rather than doing a, a complete and proper criminal investigation? One very positive thing about 9-11, every cloud has a silver lining, is that it has rekindled interest in other strange events of the past. For example, the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty, which some people are not even aware of, or the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, and how is, how is it possible that this crime is still not resolved? 9-11 has stimulated new interest in these unsolved crimes. Noam, I would be happy to answer any further questions that you may have. Sincerely, Alfred Schaefer. It made me very happy to receive an answer from Professor Noam Chomsky the very same day. Again, there was no Dear Alfred, nor was there a Sincerely Yours, only inserted in bold letters beneath my questions the following responses. My first question, what is your opinion on a German viewpoint of 9-11 and the Zionist threat, the piece I sent you? His reply, no idea what you're talking about. My second question, what do you feel in your heart when Zionist talk show host Rachel Maddow mocks Bob McElvain for mourning his murdered son Bobby? She mocks him as being not only crazy, but dangerous. All of these nefarious conspiracies about government plots to kill and conspire and lie about it and cover up the real truth. I mean, this stuff is as ridiculous as it has ever been, but it is as ridiculous as it is dangerous. His reply, have never listened to Maddow in my life and know nothing about her. <laughs> I could not make any sense out of the following statements he inserted in my email following my description of Assistant Attorney General and later Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff. His reply, your claim with no evidence, same with what follows. Plus, he wrote, simple, respond at last to the overwhelming evidence that whatever happened on 9-11, the Bush administration was not involved, instead of continuing to evade it. I don't know what he was trying to say here. This was not what I was expecting from a famous linguistics professor. At this point, it became more than clear that Professor Chomsky would continue to evade my questions. He was dedicated to the official lies and had no shame to repeat these lies. My entire correspondence with Professor Chomsky was shared with an extensive blind carbon copy list which included individuals as well as institutions. This was no secret. I wrote him that at the beginning, that these people were interested in what he had to say. Using an extensive BCC list provided me the added value of now being able to provide you with an excellent example of controlled opposition, which is another aspect of the Zionist control of events and the discourse. We will co cover controlled opposition at the end of this lesson. Now, let's go through what I wrote him on November 10th, 2013. I gave my final email to him the title, Chomsky Falls. Dear Noam Chomsky, thank you for your contributions to this piece. I see no point in continuing our dialogue on what really happened on 9-11. Dear everyone on BCC, I encourage each and every person who has some understanding and interest in what is going on with our politics to ensure that not a single person in your circle of friends remains unaware of what Zionism is and what happened on 9-11. Do not risk the embarrassment of being the very last person to know what happened. And do not let your friends be the last to know. Save them the embarrassment of still not knowing, 
if any are still unaware. We are all emerging from one from the biggest brainwashing exercise ever done on humanity. Just as each and every one of us remembers where we were on that fateful day of 9-11-2001, each and every one of us will remember when we first began to understand what really happened. And if we learn this through a friend, we will always honor the courage that this friend showed in presenting the evidence. You be that friend. To my Jewish friends, I am even more adamant. To them, I say, you are completely innocent of any wrongdoing. You have only been deceived and brainwashed like almost all of us were. And now that you know, it is of utmost importance to reach out to your friends and neighbors before they come to you. It has become pointless to continue the dialogue with Noam Chomsky as he has shown himself to be a Zionist fascist. He is not interested in empirical evidence and cares not for the fate of the victims of 9-11. Noam Chomsky is deterring democracy by manufacturing consent for the ridiculous official conspiracy theory of the 19 bad Muslims taking down all those buildings on 9-11. He will not even consider admitting that there was anything unusual about building WTC-7. He is driving the United States of America to become a failed state. Now we will go through an example of the controlled opposition that I mentioned a few moments ago. These are the folks who work for the Zionists, but pretend to be working for the cause of justice, all the while diverting attention and distracting away from what is really going on. By doing this, they are deceiving many good people into wasting precious time and resources on futile endeavors. One of the institutions on the BCC list was U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. The Legislative Coordinator, Manager of Finance and Administration, Mike Coogan, wrote me the following after having received my initial Chomsky Stumbles email. He wrote, Alfred, I agree with Mr. Chomsky and am surprised he even responded to your collection of nonsensical theories and invectives. As a longtime admirer of Mr. Chomsky, I think his reputation and analysis are as strong as ever. <laughs> Wow. Okay, this response is sufficient proof that this organization is in fact controlled opposition. Also, they always stay well clear of ever mentioning anything that contradicts the official version of 9-11. Mike Coogan had ample opportunity to go through the links I had sent him to see for himself just how strong Noam Chomsky's reputation and analysis really are. How can it be? that someone who works for the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation will defend an obvious Zionist fascist gatekeeper. This clearly reveals the, the depth of Zionist control over institutions that are masquerading as being opposed to the Zionist project of Greater Israel to deceive many, many people into thinking that they are doing something to oppose this fascism while hurting them along to prevent any real opposition. The U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation does not have an opinion on 9-11, much as Noam Chomsky does not have an opinion on 9-11. If they were what they are posing to be, their title could be U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation of Palestine, and they would most certainly be drumming as hard as they possibly could to reveal the truth about 9-11 and not shielding a gatekeeper such as Professor Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Evasion of the empirical evidence is an acknowledgement of complicity and guilt in this crime of the century against humanity. All of the mainstream media in the West, as well as all of our politicians, are working as controlled opposition, which is a sorry statement of what has happened to our society. Democracy and free press is a thing of the past. There's just overwhelming evidence that the Bush administration wasn't involved. Very elementary evidence. You don't have to be a physicist to understand it. You just have to think for a minute. Okay? So let's think for a minute. The, uh... Now let's look at the collapse of the Twin Towers.
we are seeing explosions rather than implosions, a first in demolition history. A sequenced rumble becomes a roar as debris is thrown outward. The damage is not contained. Windows are blown from neighborhood buildings. What kind of energy enabled this? Would fire hurl metal and concrete sideways into the air? Here, a chunk of steel was flung 400 feet, wedging itself deep into Three World Financial Center on Vesey Street. A FEMA photographer taking pictures of Ground Zero wondered why so many steel beams were jutting from neighborhood buildings. What shot pieces of the towers all the way across the street? It was Christopher Bolin who brought to light, together with Professor Stephen Jones, the presence of active thermitic materials in the World Trade Center dust. For this independent and courageous work, both Christopher Bolin and Professor Stephen Jones were attacked only three weeks apart in an attempt to suppress this knowledge. Many other individuals have been murdered or otherwise intimidated into silence. What motivates you to fight for the truth? Why don't you just enjoy life and let the politicians worry about this? Well, in fact, I've had more than my fair share of good luck and fortune in life. But I've always been interested in international news and events. And 9-11 is, of course, very, very important. It really has changed the world, but not for the better. For the longest time, shamefully long actually, I believed the mainstream media and the official narrative of what happened on 9-11 to some degree. Oh, I had my doubts and thought that maybe the Mossad and the CIA got wind of a plot and decided to go along with it because it benefited their own war agenda. But then, after seeing the evidence put together by architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, I understood that nothing of the official account is true other than the fact that a lot of people got killed. So I spent considerable time researching the exponentially growing inf information on the internet. Finally, I realized that understanding what is going on and not doing anything about it was not an option. I started blogging on different sites, for example, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, Information Clearinghouse, and many other sites. This was a very educational time for me. I learned a lot about controlled opposition, censorship, and Hasbara with their methods of trying to prevent any serious dialogue. I had also read a number of books on Talmudic Judaism and Zionism. But it was your book, Christopher, Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World, that helped me to understand the hidden architecture behind this false flag attack. Understanding this and doing nothing would make me criminally negligent. But Alfred, what do you suggest people do? I mean, what can anyone do? Don't you think this is kind of hopeless? Oh no, not at all. What you can do depends on your life situation. The first thing you do is inform yourself and understand the facts. Do not think for one moment that just because our controlled politicians and our controlled mainstream media do not talk about 9-11 that it is not important. The same people who brought us 9-11 control the media as well as our politicians. If you believe the lies, then you are more prone to make serious mistakes in the future when decisions do need to be made. You can easily be incited to make the wrong decisions. Remember, that's what this is all about. Incitement to move in a predetermined direction. We are, we are seeing the same thing now with events unfolding in the Ukraine. Let's say, for example, you are a student. What you can do, besides making sure that all your friends understand, is raise the subject in class. 
Demand that the teacher or professor explain to you how those 19 bad Muslims managed to place the thermite in the three towers, since we now know that the hijackings were staged and the military drones that hit the twin towers were only part of the deception. If the teacher cannot provide a satisfactory answer, let your contempt be known. And remind your teacher every day that the answer is now overdue. Or, if you have to write an essay, you could write everything you know about WTC7 and the criminals that are running the show. Make sure that nobody mistakes you for someone who would believe the official nonsense. That would be embarrassing. Would you feel pride in proclaiming that the earth is flat? I don't think so. One more example of what you can do. Let's say you are teaching your children vocabulary or colloquial expressions. You could explain how Larry Silverstein, after his role in murdering thousands of Americans and making billions of dollars with his insurance fraud, used his stolen money to build Freedom Tower on Ground Zero. Throughout the construction period of Freedom Tower, the United States was rapidly being remodeled into a police state with Zionist Jews in all key positions. You could use this example when explaining the meaning of adding insult to injury, or enslavement, or irony, or chutzpah, or audacity. If you want to describe two-tiered justice system, or above the law, you could describe how you, will, how you will be prosecuted if you get caught stealing a bag of peanuts. But Larry Silverstein, when asked about his role in this mass murder of Americans, even after admitting that he decided to pull it, just walks away from the microphone and that is the end of that, at least for now. Only a Zionist Jew will have this privilege. In fact, that is the very reason why, if you are Jewish, you, it would behoove you to waste no time before going to your neighbors and friends. Doing nothing entails the risk of your silence being interpreted as complicity and guilt. As time goes by, this becomes increasingly difficult until finally it is too late. Sort of like the icebergs. Or, if you read a newspaper or magazine from the Zionist-controlled mainstream media, Cancel the subscription and write the editor that the reason for cancelling is that you don't trust them because they are omitting the most important news and pushing lies. The Zionists do this because we let them. People cannot understand why our so-called friend and ally Israel would do such a thing. How do you explain that? Well. If you read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was a blueprint for advancing the Zionist agenda printed over 100 years ago, as well as what other Zionist pioneers had written, you will find that the domination of Zionist Jews in the mainstream media is no accident. This was systematically pursued to gain control over entire populations in these countries. With control of the media, it became possible to incite these populations to move in the intended direction. 9-11 was an all-or-nothing exercise to incite the, the Western, predominantly Christian populations to wage war on Israel's perceived enemies, who are predominantly Muslim. These wars diverted vast resources to the Zionist military-industrial complex. We see today that this Zionist attack on the West has been phenomenally successful for the perpetrators. But the game goes on. 9-11 was done to incite us to hate Muslims, much as we are now being incited to hate Russia, which is now targeted for subjugation and punishment. If we drift along, thinking that somehow everything will be okay for us, we will have a hard time explaining to our children why we did nothing to prevent the nightmare that they will have to endure. The end game of Zionism is the, subju the subjugation and enslavement of humanity. If I look at countries like Canada, for example, it makes me sad to see how that country has been reduced to a resource base for Rothschild Zionist corporations. 
the general population of Canada was not at all prepared for the predatory and stealthy takeover of their country by the Zionists. You will not find many countries as dumbed down and brainwashed as Canada is today. The statement is, of course, a generalization. There are many good Canadians who are waking up and protesting. You only need to read the comments beneath articles about Stephen Harper. He is the Zionist administrator posing as Prime Minister. In fact, as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion predicted over 100 years ago, the Zionist Jews would have their administrators ruling the world. If anyone steps out of line, they have all others attack them and set examples with extreme punishments to keep the rest in line. Russia and Iran are now targeted for punishment. Russia is showing too much independence and Iran will not voluntarily submit to slavery. Don't you think it's a bit dangerous to be an activist for 9-11 Truth? You know, Christopher, you were physically attacked for what you had discovered. You are one of the extremely small number of people who helped get the cat out of the bag. This was not supposed to happen. At that time, they thought that if they eliminate those making these discoveries, they will get away with this. Let's face it. This false flag attack required huge resources and they were in no mood to have some little independent investigative journalist or some chemistry professor get in the way. After you murder thousands of Americans, a few more to keep the cat in the bag is no big deal. They murdered many witnesses and attacked both you and Professor Stephen Jones. They wanted you silenced or dead killed in the rigged prison system. Their hands would appear to remain clean while you would be eliminated. So going into, into exile did in fact save your life, Christopher. Now the cat is out of the bag, so killing you would make no more sense. In fact, it would only attract more attention to your work. Even if they did come around and started killing all the truthers, we would still be the winners. <laughs> Let me explain. If they shot you for, talk, for your talking about the icebergs while on the Titanic because you were ruining the party mood, it would spare you the agony of seeing the massive death and suffering of the sinking. The sinking definitely changed the party mood and probably would have killed you anyway. So who do you think is going to win in the end? Zionism or humanity? Oh, that's easy. Humanity. You see, Zionism is a parasitic, supremacist ideology. And as with any parasite, it requires a healthy host in order to thrive. The very latest point in time that the parasite dies is when the host dies. If the host wants to survive, it has to deal with the parasite. In this case, the host is being sufficiently dumbed down by the parasite to continue believing the ridiculous and obvious lies of 9-11. But a population that is successfully dumbed down to that level has little chance of survival as a society. It will be incapable of dealing with the real problems such as environmental degradation. So Zionism will find its end, probably quite soon. How much of humanity will survive? That is the real question. You only have to follow the quantity and quality of information on the internet which has escaped the total control of the Zionists to see that humanity is, in fact, making a comeback. The game-changer internet was not even conceived when the Zionists set out on their brazen subjugation of humankind a long, long time ago. Since Noam Chomsky pretends that you are an idiot, and of no significance. Do you think that your criticism will have any effect on him? Oh, for sure. Noam Chomsky is drowning in a sea of lies. I am not the first and certainly not the last to use the Zionist-approved method of hiding in the tall grass with a long rifle. He's an easy target. He is fatally wounded because he will never know if I or any of my friends are in the room. 
and we will demand a proper answer to a very clear question. We will always begin with WTC7. We will scream this question to him and no longer be taken for a sucker. We know the truth and are prepared to die for the truth. To keep the lies going is infinitely more difficult than to just face the truth. Except, of course, for the criminals. Let me add to that as a closing statement. The mood of people throughout the world can be summarized by the following statement. Someone needs to tell Obama that black slavery was abolished in the United States of America a long time ago. If this guy really wants to do what the world needs, he can start by rebelling against his Zionist masters and act like the person he pretended to be to get elected. Yes, he might be shot dead like JFK, but at least he would have done something useful with his life before that. American people, start a fight for your liberation from the Zionists. Their power lies in money, secrecy and trickery. Your power is in your sheer number and you will find the whole world on your side. Thank you.